Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the launch of the new center at Martin Luther University College, the Center for Spirituality, Disability, and Care. I am so grateful that you are able to join us this morning and grateful that we have the technology that allows us to gather from all over Canada and other places as well. So again, welcome to this momentous time. I'm really looking forward to how the center is gonna support our ongoing thinking, uh, critical reflection and action as it comes to areas of inclusivity and how do we support greater inclusion in all of our communities. Um, and I, uh, I look forward to the leadership this center will provide in this area. As we begin this morning, it's important for us to remember and to acknowledge that Martin Luther University College is located on the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe and the neutral people. And it is important for us to remember because historically there have been indigenous peoples on this land and there currently are are continuing to be Indigenous people living with us and among us. And there is much for us to learn uh, and grow and um, become wiser in our, in our times together. And I look forward to our ongoing learning that we can do with the Indigenous peoples of Canada. So as we begin this morning, I would in invite Laura McGregor, who has been the director and the creator of this new center, to begin our morning by introducing our speakers. Laura. Thank you, Chris. First, I'd like to invite all, uh, sorry, welcome all of you to the launch of this, the Luther Center for Spirituality, Disability and Care, especially today on the International Day for Persons with Disabilities. My hope for the center is that it will create radically welcoming communities, particularly faith communities, which embrace the full participation and leadership of people with disabilities, as well as their families and caregivers. The goal for the center is to foster lively and creative spaces for conversation, connection, collaboration, community among, and community among scholars, researchers, professionals, community stakeholders, faith communities, self-advocates, as well as caregivers and their families. The center values plural knowledge and expression, and it grounds its work in the expertise and the experiences of people with lived experience. So along that vein, I'd like to introduce our two speakers today. I consider myself very, very fortunate to call these two women both friends and valued colleagues. Amy Panton is a PhD candidate at the Toronto School of Theology, as well as the co-editor of the Canadian Journal of Theology, Mental Health and Disability. She is the co-host of the Mad and Crip Theology podcast series. She has a master's degree, um, sorry, a master's of theology, as well as a master's of theological studies, exploring themes of self-injury, trauma, and pastoral care. She teaches courses exploring theology and mental illness at the Toronto School of Theology and now at the Luther Center uh, Certificate for Disability in Inclusive Ministry and Christian Faith. And she identifies as a mad theologian and her work emphasizes the intersection of theology and the lived experience of mental illness. Reverend Miriam Spees is a Crip theologian whose research aims to challenge the church on how it views leadership and those who fill these roles. Her life with a physical disability has led her to challenge models of inclusion and theological unity that do not leave room for people's voices or needs. Miriam is a PhD student at Emmanuel College in Toronto, Canada, and she is an ordained minister in the United Church of Canada. She is the co-editor, along with Amy, of the Canadian Journal of Theology, sorry, of Theology, Mental Health and Disability, as well as the co-host of the Mad and Crip Theology podcast series. So to move over to the real stars of the show, Amy and Miriam, I'm going to open with the first question, and that is, you both identify as Mad or Crip theologians. And these terms have a loaded and hurtful history. I'd be interested if you would share why you have chosen to use these words to self-identify and to discuss the work you do. Thank you. Perhaps, uh, Amy, shall we start with you? Thanks so much, Laura. Yes, I'd love to start. And um, I'd like to say on behalf of Miriam and I just how happy we are and honored we are uh, to be a part of 
this launch this morning. And I'm sorry, that was my cat, Oliver. He'll probably be hanging around this morning as we're talking. So he loves to be on camera. Um, so to get us started uh, with the question that you asked, Laura, and it's a really important one. Um, I, when Miriam and I were trying to think about how we could contribute to disability studies and uh, work in spiritual care and mental health in Canada, we thought if we were to bring these terms forward in our work, uh, uh, um, sorry, as a part of our actual names when we're naming ourselves, it would be very helpful for people to understand the connections that we have, both with MAD studies and CRIP studies in our dissertation work that we're currently doing at uh, Emmanuel College at the University of Toronto. And for me, um, why I decided to uh, name myself a mad theologian is most of the time when we talk about mental and emotional distress, uh, often we default to sort of the biomedical model that uses terms like mental illness and also mental disorder. And um, according to the mad studies way of thinking about things, and also my, from my own personal experience, I think this that using these kind of language um, can make people feel almost imprisoned within this kind of mental health paradigm. And it's hard for them to find a way out. Um, it's, it's hard to think about other ways of understanding or living with mental and emotional distress. So bringing the word mad forward um, is, was really important to me for my work. And throughout history, people who've been labeled as mad have been oppressed and abused, silenced, um, caged, literally, forced to do things like unpaid labor. They've had their children taken away. They've been sold at auctions because they've been considered to be crazy. So this word mad, it is used to subvert uh, and disrupt ableism and sanism that sees mad bodies and minds as less than or also as abnormal. And so I mentioned a little bit before about mad studies and the mad movement that originated within Canada. And so the mad movement itself has links to the, some people may have heard of this before, the consumer survivor expatient movement. And so this movement, um, it explicitly rejects a biomedical approach. So for me, that means seeing people with lived experience of mental and emotional distress as being people who are broken and in need of a cure. And most of the time, or often, some of these cures can um, mean medic uh, being put on medication that has very difficult side effects, or um, sometimes they're given treatments that can even be very harmful, like things like electro electroshock therapy, or there may be use of restraints or forced confinement in hospitals. Um, so as a mad theologian, I'm a person who has lived experience of mental and emotional distress. And I believe that I have uh, certain kinds of knowledge uh, because of these experiences. And I wanna bring this knowledge into my uh, research in both in teaching and in uh, my research in practical theology. And I'd like to challenge uh, Christian faith communities to think about new ways of, um, of thinking about what madness is, especially uh, linking it to lived experience. So thanks, Laura. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, Miriam, perhaps you could talk a little bit about your decision to identify as a Crip theologian. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to put a quote in the chat by Alison Caper. She's in Quip Studies. And she writes about people who were undeniably Quip. It's a term that has much country in disability activism and culture, which might seem harsh to those outside the communities. Indeed, that harshness 
is a large part of its appeal as suggested by Nancy Mears. Quote, people crippled or not went at the board, quote, as they do not have handicap or disabled. Perhaps I want to make them win. The desire to make people win suggests an urge to shake things up, to jolt people out of their everyday understandings of bodies and minds of normalcy and decency. It recognizes the common response of non-disabled people to disabled people of the normative to the deviant furtive yet relentless sharing, aggressive questioning, and all are turning away from difference or refusal to see. This wincing is permitted to many disabled people, but here Nancy turns it back on itself, almost wincing back. So it's a term that is being reclaimed by people like me to, to make a statement. And this work as partitions. And it's also used as a verb. So, so to quip, people talk about quipping time, which bends the clock to fit disabled bodies and minds rather than expecting us to perform or fit in normative ways. And so as a quip theologian, I, like Amy, bring my lived experience and my embodied knowledge to my work. I reclaim my voice as someone who can speak for herself, for myself, and with others in the group community. And I challenge or I seek to challenge Christian faith communities to think about leadership, power, and ministry who are holding these positions and how might they be equipped to fit different bodies. So that's a bit about why I use the term quip. Thank you so much, both Amy and Miriam. And thank you, Miriam, for that discussion of, of cripping time in particular. I've been fortunate to hear you speak about cripping time and about crip time. And I find it a really helpful way to think about um, about how we bend time to embodiment. Um, it's been a really helpful discussion um, and I'm very grateful for your expertise in that area. So along the, the vein of expertise, you two are the co-editors of the Canadian Journal of Theology, Mental Health and Disability, as well as the co-hosts of the Mad and Crip Theology podcast series. Um, and you, you have a wide audience with these two, um, two forums. Can you share a little bit about your goals and vision for um, for the journal, uh, in particular the journal, but uh, as well the podcast series, and how you see your work impact 
reflecting the Canadian landscape both of theological discussion, but also um, of faith communities um, and how people with disabilities and mental illness and emotional distress sort of engage those spaces. Um, Miriam, do you want to go first this time? Oh, and we will jump in. Um, so we, well, Amy, had this dream and I got on board with this dream early on. And we wanted to create a space for people with lived experience. That includes people with disabilities and mad people as well as their families caregivers, uh, managers, etc., to get into this conversation that's been dominated by, by other voices. And so we wanted to open up publishing space for marginalized communities, including queer women, BIPOC, folks, etc., as well as disabled and mad people. And we wanted to publish student work as a way of encouraging young academics like ourselves to get a foot in the door and to try, try out publishing in a fairly relaxed journal. Maybe Amy, you want to share about the collaborative peer review? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Miriam. So, um... I was thinking as you were talking that part of our, our dream when we were first getting the journal launched was we really wanted to have a space online where people could come and reflect theologically on what's going on in their lives, um, whether it be a disability or mental health stuff that's happening. Um, so we decided we would have a bunch of different ways that people could become involved at the journal we are publishing opinion pieces. So people are able to talk about things that maybe haven't been um, talked about before in a journal type of atmosphere. We also have, uh, we have the academic articles. So we're working with a lot of our students at the Toronto School of Theology who are focusing on disability and mental health research. We're helping them um, uh, get their work ready for publication. And we also have, creative work too, which has just been such an awesome thing to be involved with, um, meeting with artists and um, other like poets and people have um, put in short fiction and a whole bunch of different ways of um, reflecting on, on uh, faith and disability. And it has been a lot of fun. And um, we'll, we're gonna show a couple of, um, uh, things from our new issue uh, shortly. We'll be able to show those to you. And Miriam was mentioning before that we know sometimes it can be scary to submit your work to a journal and to have people look at it and maybe critique it and give you the critique. And uh, we really wanted to help people not be so scared. So what we did is we have more of a collaborative approach to uh, peer review at our journal. And uh, Laura has been very helpful for us in helping guide some of our authors. And we have a few other trusted mentors who've been helping our authors. Uh, so they don't just receive feedback and cry at their desk. They're able and try to figure everything out on their own. What we're able to do is have a Zoom call with with a trusted uh, advisor and they'll go through your work with you and it'll be, uh, we've heard very positive feedback from this 
model. So if you are thinking, oh, I have a paper, I'd really love to put it into the journal, but I'm not sure if it, it'll be the right one, or I'm not sure what they'll say, please do, please do submit. Um, and we would love to be able to work with you on that. Uh, another thing I might quickly say about the, the journal is, so we've, we've published two issues. We just put out our fall issue and we designed a reading guide that faith communities can use. Um, what we were hoping is that you'd pick a piece from the journal, whether that's like you, you want to read an academic article, like Laura has a paper that was published in this issue, or if you're feeling more like you want to read a poem or, or an opinion piece, you could pick one and then you'd be able to take a look at our reading guide, which is published at the end of the journal. And there's a way, uh, we've created a way for you to move through the pieces um, in a kind of like almost an embodied way where you can um, write down your thoughts and feelings and emotions as you're moving through. And then you can, there's some questions there for you to discuss at the end. And so we're hoping that this can become a resource for faith communities, or even just for you and a couple of friends, or even if you just wanna do it solo at home, um, you'd be able to use this resource to get some conversation going or some thoughts going about what we've published. Miriam, do you wanna um, add to that? We also have a Facebook page if any of you want to follow on there where we post links to different articles. Something that we do in this journal is ask people for an author's note to share what behind that work. What was the motivation for this particular work, which sometimes gets missed in academic conversations. And we added to, we added a podcast to model how, model how communities can have conversations around disability and mental health so that they don't seem too hard or too, um, people can feel like they don't understand enough to have the conversation. So we wanted to model some education and some group reflection that can and should happen within communities. And as well as we talk about publishing space, we wanted to this what who is the expert on on people's life. So moving away from the psych medical able-bodied same male as person with all the power to tell stories and to interpret them theologically that that mothers and people with lived experience have the right to share their stories and share their theological knowledge. Maybe we can share some art with us. Thanks, Miriam. Yeah, so what we were gonna do now is just take a few moments to show you a couple of submissions that we've published for this most recent issue. And I hope you can see my screen okay. So if you go to the issue, you'll be able to see in the creative work section, we have published 
uh, Dr. Iris J. Gilby's paintings in this issue. So she's a professor of teaching stream books and media studies at St. Mike's at U of T. And so we always put the author's contact information too, in case you want to reach out to them. So I'm just going to slowly scroll here and you'll be able to see hopefully most of the painting that she has submitted. And so, um, so this, um, this painting is called Forgiven. And so we asked her to write a little bit about what the painting means. So she said, love breaks through. In my experience, love always breaks through. That is what this piece is about, what it expresses and what it reminds me of. So much is written about forgiveness. In my opinion, as a feminist trauma theorist, most of what is written is not survivor centered and can actually block survivors from journeying through our own nonlinear and multidimensional rich pathways that entwine selfhood, gender, and spiritual discovery. I have known no greater beauty than the occasions of forgiveness that arrive as moments of deep communion. For me, however, these occasions are not cognitively structured. They are land-based and embodied, and they sing through my flesh in a way that is similar to the movement of color in this painting. Such a beautiful painting. And so maybe I'll just share one more of Iris's pieces. This one's a little bit more of the darker tones. It's light at the bottom. And this one is called Going Home and it's acrylic on canvas. And she writes, I often feel that I am always journeying home that I'm always already home. It has always been this way and my hope at least is that it always will be. This, speak, speak, this piece speaks to me of this dialectical play of belonging in which our experiences can at once other us and be that which root us so deeply to who we are in this life. Perhaps it is the shift from blue to gold, but in the meditative presence that is for me art making, this dialectical interplay finds perfect acceptance, which in my experience has been the truest healing. I'm just gonna, just gonna scroll down a little bit farther and I'll show you the author's note that Miriam was talking about earlier for this piece. So every piece has, like Miriam was saying, a little behind the scenes note from the author. So I'll just read this one. So Iris says, these images were painted as a means of exploring, communicating, coming to terms with reimagining and accepting childhood trauma. While recovering from childhood trauma is a difficult and emotionally challenging journey, I have found it is also a journey that is unparalleled in the depths of spirituality that healing and creative expression have manifested for me. My creative practice, like my spirituality, is influenced by a deep perception to interfaith wisdom traditions that guide me toward experiencing and representing what is always an ineffable contact between the human and the divine. I believe strongly that those of us who journey through the more intense spectrums of trauma and the mental health responses that inevitably mark such journeys are also able to access invaluable insights. These are insights to rich experiences of spiritual and human reality that normative culture fails to recognize and or integrate as an essential part of the human experience. And she just finishes with living in these margins of spirituality and mental health encounters can be isolating. In my experience, cultural approaches to trauma recovery tend to fail survivors. Yet art as a means of self-exploration and creative transformation is able to support us as, in my case of surviving childhood sexual abuse, we reclaim the parts of ourselves the cultural norms teach us to silence and repress. That spirituality and art intersect in the ongoing recovery from childhood trauma is a beautiful reality to me that I seek to explore creatively. These images are witnessing to and manifesting of that exploratory process. So we, we wanna thank Iris so much for her work. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Amy and Miriam. That was beautiful. Um, I. 
feel so fortunate to have been involved in some of the ongoing and behind the scenes work of the journal. Um, I have participated in collaborative review both as a writer, but also as uh, a so-called mentor. Um, and it has been such a rewarding experience um, in, in both roles. I would say particularly as a writer, um, it's, it's overwhelming writing and to be able to sort of receive direct feedback from a reviewer in a really collaborative and supportive way saying, I love these ideas, but I think you need to push them farther here or perhaps consider this was such a, a powerful and, and empowering experience. So I was so grateful to be part of it. I also so value the journal's commitment to the lived experience. Um, I know as a mother of a profoundly disabled child, I often felt very silenced because I was quote, just the mom. Um, and the journal has been a place where I felt my voice had, had space and that I could talk about my experiences, both in a personal and an academic way. And it's been, it's been wonderful. I feel, I feel very, very fortunate to be part of this experience. So getting, you know, getting back to this, this journal um, and the podcast as well, um, I'm curious to know what your hope and vision for these, uh, the work you're doing with the journal and the podcast might be both for Canadian theology, say academically in a scholarly way, but also in terms of sort of boots on the ground, wheels on the ground experience of living in community, living in faith communities. How do you see your work um, with the journal and the podcast as creating spaces that are radically welcoming and hospitable to people with diverse experiences? Um, who wants to start? Amy. Okay, sure. Thank you, Laura. Um, well, I think one thing that is really important to Miriam and I is that um, our the journal and the podcast that we're sort of pouring our, our hearts into right now are, are picked up and used. Um, I hope that people will find some resonances there from their own lived experience, as well as, um, you know, sometimes there might be some tensions, um, some difficult pieces that you encounter, and we hope that we'll be able to talk about them, um, you know, you can always drop us an email uh, and we'd love to have you as a part of the conversation. I might just quickly um, put in the chat the reading guide that, the link to the reading guide that Miriam and I were talking about before. So one thing that you could do, like we were mentioning before, is you could use this reading guide to go through Iris's pieces and um, engage with her work a little bit more deeply. And you'll find, there are beautiful pieces in this in this issue that I, Miriam and I really hope will be um, meaningful to you. Um, the other thing that Miriam and I talk about a lot, and that has come up a lot in our most recent podcasts, is this idea of challenging more conventional images of God. That um, you know we we talk and we've talked in the podcast recently about. The kind of God images that we grew up with as kids, you know, who was God to us? What did God look like? And how did that impact us? Um, and how does it still impact, impact us as adults? Um, and we had talked recently in the podcast about the influence of Nancy Eastland's work about um, the mind blowing things that happened to us when we learned about her, uh, her image of God in a wheelchair and using a sip puff wheelchair and also the influence of Anton Boysen's um, ideas of Jesus being mad or having an experience of psychosis. And how does this impact who God is in our minds? So that's one thing I, I want to mention that Miriam and I want to keep sort of chasing some of these um, in the footsteps of some people who have gone before us like Eastland and Boysen and maybe bring it to, to, to the 21st century. Um, Miriam? Again, uh, we want to continue to challenge who's in leadership and how, and we do that through our journal, through Amy and I, 
think of a tap as we go about how to win a journal in the podcast. Um, and we want, we hope that this dialogue, this conversation lessens the shame among help seeking for disabilities and madness. I think Amy has a story to share there. Do I? Can you just remind me of the story? Yeah, the story <laughs> of a uh, pudgy who went to. Oh, thank you, Miriam. Yes, yes. We, we had discussed this yesterday. So um, um, I recently uh, found out that some of the clergy members who are connected to the United Church of Canada had said that there's a lot of deep shame that they've been feeling around um, the medications that they're taking, especially around antidepressant use. And um, we were talking recently about their need, they feel the need to actually go and fill their prescriptions in a different city because they were really scared that somebody from their congregation might see them filling a prescription for antidepressants. And so uh, it made me really think a lot about why that is. And is it possible that we could contribute a little bit to helping lessen some of that shame and stigma around um, taking medications for, for psychiatric conditions and also maybe needing a little bit of help in difficult times um, regarding anxiety and depression. So these are the types of issues that we hope to be able to open up more of a dialogue for uh, around um, in the journal, the podcast, and also, of course, with Laura's work here at the center. And that Amy and I are both working on our dissertations. Amy's father had than I am, but this journal is a way, a place where we can put all work on learning into practice and not be inside our own books or our own writing on the time, but to reach out to others and to communities. So we are grateful to be reaching out to Martin Luther and I'm so excited for this new center and so proud of Laura for her work in creating and directing this. Thank you. Thank you, Miriam. As I said, I I, uh, as I've often said, I hope this is the beginning of a beautiful relationship between your work and the work of Luther and of the wider community um, in terms of scholars and people with lived experience and families and self advocates and people who lead faith communities. I so I so hope that together we can all work to create a Canadian landscape that is more welcoming for all people and values all stories and expertise. And I particularly love your commitment to the less sort of the less traditionally academic form of expertise. So your commitment to art and creative work and embodied faith, those are all so meaningful. Um, I guess at this point, I'm looking at the time, I'd love to turn this over to the community and are there any questions or comments from people who are joining us today i know that we're also recording this and many people will be participating at a later date but for those who are here today um, are there any questions or comments that you might have for amy or miriam while we have them here and yes yeah, so uh, we invite you to put those questions in the chat box and uh, I can read them out to Amy and Miriam. Oh, 
and Alan has one. Great, thank you. Um, I'll read this, Alan. Uh, so this is from Dr. Alan Jorgensen, who is uh, on faculty at Luther. Thanks for this. I would be interested in hearing from any of you or all three of you some of your thoughts about how intentional attention to art challenges or develops the ways in which you have understood theological themes. So I'll let Amy and Miriam jump in. Amy, Miriam, either of you? Thank you, Alan, so much for your question. Yeah, that that's really that's really interesting to think about. Um, I think maybe um, when we were thinking about how we wanted to position the journal in the beginning, um, Miriam and I talked to one of our mentors, Tom Reynolds, at uh, Emmanuel College, and it actually was his idea to incorporate creative work. I think that he was. Um, excited to open up the the dialogue beyond just the printed word and I mean I love the printed word it is I've always it's my home books have been my home since I was little you can ask my mom I used to carry around an encyclopedia when I was two um, but you know um, I think it, it's been so fascinating to me and I'm, I, I'm sure Miriam feels the same way that as we've been in, uh, in these editorial roles, how many people are reflecting on, you know, lived experience of disability and mental health stuff through their art? It's actually been, I, I, we've been so surprised and we've been so blessed um, that people have answered the call for submissions. Every time we put out a call for papers and submissions, we have more than we even thought we would get. So we're just so, um, happy and excited to be able to bring this uh, sort of like the larger community of people who are working in this area together with the journal. And um, we also have the authors and artists on our podcast as well. So they can like, you know, their Iris's paintings, for example, will be posted online for everybody to see. And then we're going to invite her to come on the podcast to talk about her paintings and her process and everything. So you can get even like a deeper, um, a deeper dive into some of her work. So Alan, I hope that helps. Miriam, did you wanna add anything? Okay. I'm not sure I have anything to add either, just that I know as a mother of a profoundly, a, a child with profound intellectual disabilities who is also nonverbal, um, I felt his spiritual experiences and wisdom were often discounted by the sort of greater world, greater community, both generically, but also within faith communities. And I believed that my son had a deep spiritual life, um, had a deep and active engagement in faith that that went beyond an intellectual engagement, where that went beyond something that could be expressed with ideas and words. And I struggled with faith communities that privileged those, those ways of knowing God. So I have been enormously grateful for Amy and Miriam's commitment to exploring these other forms of expertise, this plural wisdom that goes beyond the traditional academic sort of privileging of, of words and the printed word in particular and ideas and often lofty theological ideas um, and allows, create space for these other forms of expertise and wisdom that offer a more robust theological understanding sort of to all of us. So yeah, thank you. I am so grateful for your work um, that you are doing in this area. Are there other questions um, from the, the larger community, from people attending today? Again, I'll read it out. Uh, Chris, Dr. Chris Lund asks, how do you think the pandemic might have created an environment or a context that is open to these questions and conversations? Maybe I will begin and then Amy can, can uh, follow up with pandemics. But our first issue focus on COVID-19 and we were um, very aware that 
covered and it had different effect on mad and queer people than they did on the average population. So what there's isolation room for people who are already isolated. Um, and what did what does online church mean for people who couldn't go to church necessarily before the pandemic? And how does that actually create places for people to engage in faith that won't otherwise possible. I think, uh, yeah, maybe Amy can share now. Mm, I think that um, I just popped the link in there for um, the, the issue that Miriam was talking about that concentrated on COVID. And yeah, I think, I think uh, maybe not at this time as much in the pandemic, but at the beginning of the pandemic, I think we saw a lot of people in our communities really um, coming together and helping each other. Maybe, maybe it's just me, but I feel like we settled in a little bit more at this point. But um, like, I wanna highlight particularly like Elizabeth Moeller and Alexa Gilmore's article where they talk about um, how people in the uh, in the disability community in in the area that they live in Toronto all rallied together and made sure that people were literally getting food and water and the things that they needed to be able to just literally survive during this difficult time um, and we also have some um, pieces on um, some of the unfortunate suicides that, uh, death by suicides that happened um, by people in the medical profession due to stress and over just overwhelm. And uh, we have another piece on how um, the author, an author was like the, the tension that exists between him and his mother and his mother's um, online presence regarding COVID and his own positions, uh, theological positions. So. Uh, I, I would, we would encourage you to take a peek if you, you have some time at some of these conversations that were going on. And I think uh, what we really want to do with the journal is continue to encourage people to write and submit and just become a part of this um, beautiful conversation that's been springing up. Uh, and can, I think Canadians are, we can all admit Canadians are often very shy and maybe a little reserved. And now we're seeing some people coming together and um, shaking things up a little bit, which has been fun, very fun to be a part of. We've got a couple of more questions. We've got about maybe uh, two or three minutes. And I'm gonna jump to um, Mona Lef Dr. Le Mona LaFosse's question um, because I think it, it ties into your first question. So um, I appreciated your explanation of the choice of using the words mad and crit for your work in discussions. It's such a compelling way to frame your work. I have heard people use terms like otherly abled rather than disabled. I would be interested to hear how you understand these words from an academic perspective and perhaps from or in terms of your lived experience as you feel comfortable to share. Can you guys sort of maybe offer like a three or four minute answer to that? Thank you. Uh, I will go first. I have quite an on react in the words and then the able to definitely able to. I actually hate those words now because they try to fit our bodies into what's considered the norm and our bodies are not the norm. <laughs> the, disabled in that group. So being honest about that, which doesn't 
limit happen in conversation about abilities or trying to work, which is famous as disruptive to the norm because we are, and maybe that's a good thing. I think for me, um, oh, thank you, Miriam, for your, your insights there. And I think for me, um, when I was trying to, I think we all go through, well, maybe, I don't, I don't think I'm alone in this. We all sort of go through our, um, uh, as we're working in academia, we're trying to figure out what our, our voice is going to be like as an academic person. What are we going to be focusing on? And part of me finding my voice was finding this kind of identity that I really wanted to like hook on to some of the mad studies um, work that's going on in Canada and different parts of the world and uh, ask what does mad studies have to say to theology and what does theology have to say to mad studies and um, bring, bring this conversation together because I had not uh, ever seen any place where that had really been done explicitly. So that's where, that's what my work is uh, concentrating on Mona in my dissertation. My dissertation's on self-injury. So for kids who are cutting or burning their skin, uh, and it brings in the MAD studies sort of framework um, to, to that conversation. So I hope that helps. Thank you so much, Amy and Miriam. I'm, I, I don't even know where to begin to say thank you. Um, so to sort of conclude today, um, I'm going to start by thanking the Luther community for thanking Reverend Dr. Chris Lund for her incredible support and ongoing encouragement for the work of not only this Luther Center, but also the collaborative work that we're doing with the Canadian Journal. I'd like to thank all of the faculty at Luther who have been enormously supportive, I know of my work, but again, of this more collective work. Thank you so much. Um, and I'd like to thank you, the audience, for joining us today, for joining us later via the recording, for your engaged questions and participation, even in this mediated space. Thank you so much. And most of all, I need to offer my heartfelt and deep gratitude to Amy and Miriam. I am very fortunate to call these amazing women friends and role models and mentors. And I feel so privileged to be able to work with them. They are, they are brilliant scholars. I have complete faith that they are going to make an enormous impact on both the Canadian, but I hope the international landscape in terms of this, this discussion we're having about theology and mental illness and caregiving in, in Canada that places significant value on the balance of scholarship and lived experience. I am so grateful for the work you're doing and for the trailblazing that you are doing um, for all of us. Thank you so much. And to conclude, I'd like to encourage all of you who are here to check us out at Luther, to continue to be involved in this work that we're doing here at the Luther Center for the work that people are doing at the, with the journal, Amy and Miriam are doing with the journal and the podcast, be involved, um, join conversations, submit your work, um, please participate. Check out the other centers at Luther. We have a rich and vibrant Luther community who is engaged, that are engaged in so many meaningful activities. So we, you can find information about the centers on the Luther website, as well as the academic work that we're doing and the continuing education work where Amy will be teaching this summer in theology and mental health. We are so grateful that she'll be joining our team. Um, so please uh, check out the website, check out the work we're doing, become part of the conversation and the community. Thank you so much.